Um, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Niranjan, for uh, inviting me to LA. It's a great opportunity. Um, in this presentation, I will be talking about um, the negative portrayal of two famous Chauhan kings um, in Jain literature, and I will focus um, on a remarkable but little understood epic, Sanskrit epic poem composed by a Jain author, Naya Chandra Suri, in the beginning of the 15th century. And I will also um, show how its unconventional content is um, connected to the emergence of bardic literature. But let me first introduce you to who these Chawan kings were and why they inspired a large literary tradition that continues up till present day. Uh, so the most famous Chawan king is um, undoubtedly uh, Prithviraj of Ajmer, who became famous for his struggle against Muhammad of Gore, who was a, lord, a war lord of Afghanistan. Uh, he was defeated um, at the end of the 12th century uh, in Tarain, uh, where the Red Dot is. Uh, and the downfall of Ajmer was also followed by um, the downfall of the empire of Jai Chandra of Benauj. These um, sieges of Muhammad Ghori were very important because they laid the foundation for what would become the first Islamic realm in South Asia, namely the Delhi Sultanate. Kutviraj Chawan, uh, most Indians will have heard about him because he's generally um, yeah, seen as the, the last Hindu emperor. Um, and he's also recently given a, a memorial um, in Ajmer, um, which depicts Kutviraj as a Hindu patriot who, um, who, who should be admired for his heroic struggle against the first Muslim invader. This is also how he's been portrayed in a more recent TV show, uh, which also deals with the life story of Prithviraj, which you can see on the right. Um, I should also uh, refer to a, a book, a new book from Cynthia Talbot, which came out this January about uh, Prithviraj. She has a, it's a very good book, which shows the, 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 the various imaginations of Prithviraj throughout the centuries. And our main focus is on this uh, epic Prithviraj Raso um, uh, in old Rajasthani, which um, it's very interesting, and um, it's, it, it kind of helped also contrib contributing to this image of Pitfraj as an admirable ruler who in the end is even um, able to, to avenge his defeat and kill uh, Muhammad Ghori. Uh, but historically, of course, this did not happen. And after the downfall of Ajmer, we see the huge expansion of, uh, of the Delhi Sultanate. And this brings us to another famous Chawan king, namely Amira Chawan of Rantampur. Um, he became famous for his struggle against the Sultan Alauddin Khalji, uh, during whose rule, uh, whose rule um, the Delhi Sultanate saw its largest expansion. Um, here you see an image of uh, this Battle of Rantambor uh, from a 19th century epic called Hamir Hat. Uh, you see Hamir uh, at Rantambor on the right and Alauddin on the left. Uh, this is how Rantambor looks today. It uh, lies in ruins in a uh, national park in a wildlife sanctuary in uh, east of Rajasthan. So, in both popular and scholarly representations, um, these kings are generally seen as, as exemplary rulers who um, are, at, are praised in a large literary tradition. But, in fact, uh, evidence from Jain literature shows that during the Dalai Sultan period itself, these kings were often portrayed as flawed rulers. And I will show this um, through an analysis um, and contextualization of remarkable epic poem in Sanskrit, the Hamira Mahakavya, which translates as the epic poem on Hamira Chawan, but it also deals with uh, its famous predecessors like Prithviraj. Um, it was composed by the Jain monk and poet, Naya Chandra Suri, uh, under the patronage of Rama Tomara uh, in the kingdom of Gwalior in the beginning of the 15th century. Um, up till now, scholars have uh, always interpreted this uh, poem as, a, as an epic poem, which is, was uh, composed to praise uh, these Chawan kings. Uh, I'll just illustrate this with, a, with two quotations. One of the Anil Kant Kirtana, 
Kitane who uh, composed, uh, who wrote the first edition of this poem, he says, the hero of the poem is Hamira Chowan of Ranastambapura, a name celebrated in Hindi song. Hamira is one of those later heroes of India who measured their swords with the Mohammedan conquerors and fell in the defense of their independence. He deserves our sympathy and our admiration. This view is largely echoed and reproduced in later studies. Um, this is an example from Cynthia Talbot's recent book. The author of the Hamira Mahakavya must have been compelled to describe Prithviraj Chawan as a laudable warrior because of his status as an illustrious predecessor of Hamira, the main hero of the work, who was a Chawan lord. She, she does touches on, uh, she does discuss the negative portrayal of Prithviraj um, in earlier Jain lit literature, but she still sees the Hamira Mahakavya as primarily a eulogistic poem about the Chawan kings. But his poem could, uh, can, be read, can be read differently, and this is what I, what I will show throughout this paper. Um, I will try to tackle this idea of Hamir Mahakavya being an eulogy, and instead will argue that it can be read as a critique of the Chawan kings inspired by earlier Jain literature. Um, so the, the, this epic is in fact very, a very complex uh, poem, and. Um, the, the context of the composition should already trigger some important question about the motivation of Naya Chandra Suri, because why would a Jain author who is patronized by a king from the Tomara dynasty, dynasty would want to make a eulogistic poem about the king from the Chawan dynasty who perished more than a century ago? And in fact, there's a, a deep tension between this, for, this, this. It is actually composed in the format of a Mahakavya, a poem that is usually... Uh, it usually celebrates the life stories of, this, of, the, of the protagonist. But in the Mahamira Mahakavya, we see a deep tension between this format of this eulogy and the theme of defeat. Because already in the, it's already clear from the, the plot, uh, in the end, the Hamira, the, the hero of the poem, dies. He cuts off his head and he obtains heaven. Uh, recently, um, someone, uh, Michael Bader has argued that this that this text uh, kind of praises this defeat as an heroic success, which, was, which became a hallmark of a lot later Rajput uh, culture and literature. Uh, here's an illustration of Hamira uh, cutting off his head. Uh, it's in the middle of a, also an illustration to the Hamir Hat, this late uh, old Hindi poem. Uh, but it's also only, I think it's only on the surface that this is about praising this Rajput culture, because in fact, Naya Chandra's story seems to be much more concerned with ridiculing the defeat of all the Chawan kings. Um, this is what I will show. So um, I argue that we can view the Hamira Mahakavya as an ironic eulogy, which is inspired by the negative portrayal of Prithviraj Chawan in Jain historical literature, known as uh, Prabhanda. And it could be viewed as a response to the positive portrayal of Hamira in an oral body. Let me first show, um, explain you the key element of the Hamira tradition. Namely, um, he, Hamira became famous because he, he vowed to protect four, a couple of Mongol leaders who had taken refuge with Hamira at Rantambor. Um, so Hamira in Nayashandra's time was generally seen as a good, a virtuous ruler. It can also be seen from a contemporary uh, story collection, the Purush Pariksha of Vidyapati where he, has, he illustrates the compassion of the hero because of this act of protecting these Mongols. Um, and this is also how Naya Chandra Suri introduces the theme of this epic. So he says, like the eminent heroes Mandhadar, Rama, and Yudhishthira, how many kings have there not been on, in this earth? Among these, the unique king Hamira is a supreme lord worthy of praise because of his quality of goodness. He further explains what constituted this quality of goodness, so he reminds his audience about this key element of the Hamira legend. Hamira, who was so set, endowed with the unique quality of goodness and possessed royal fortune, how is it that when refusing to hand over his daughter and the refugees to the Shaka ruler, the Sultan, his life and pleasure became worthless to him? So on the surface, this looks as a verse on, uh, of praise on behalf of, the, of Hamira. Um, but it can be read also differently because he implicitly hints at uh, a certain discrepancy uh, in the Hamira legend um, in this, by implicitly asking why Hamira, despite 
the quality of Putin's attributed to him, lost royal fortune. He also expresses this by saying that this, this is not, not necessarily his view, this, uh, that Hamira is a good rule. He, he adds the particle kila, which is often expressed to, uh, used to uh, show the views of others before opposing them. Um, because from a karmic standpoint, it doesn't make sense that a virtuous ruler uh, loses royal fortune. And this is a very important theme in the Hamira Makavia and in, in, in court poetry about kings in general, that the king should pursue Raja Shri, uh, royal, royal fortune. But since it ends with the defeat of Hamira, Nechandra will rather show why he lost royal fortune. Then he says why he wants to compose this poem. He says, therefore, wishing to purify the royal elite, I want to tell another life story of him. I was indeed impelled to write this life story by the respect for the various qualities relating to him, having reached the root of my ear. This again suggests this reaching uh, the root of his ear that it was attributed to, this, this, this praise was attri attributed to him, but not necessarily supported by Nayachandra Suri himself. And he wants to purify the royal elite, he wants to teach his audience something through, this, through the Yamira legend and this, and this discrepancy. So, um, throughout the Hamira Makaya, will solve this discrepancy by showing that Hamira was in fact not a virtuous ruler and therefore did not deserve this praise. Uh, um, so, he introduces uh, his. Uh, uh, um, the Hamira Maya starts with this, with this verse. Uh, Many kings from this dynasty were endowed with quivering, quivering valor. Their burden of sin was frightened away by their holy and excellent deeds in combining the three human aims, namely pleasure, karma, power, arda, and moral duty, dharma. The trivaga, the group of three. Uh, the criticism of the Hamira Maya is actually part of this larger tendency in, in uh, Indian literature to, to make fun of these aims of human life. Um, it will show, although this also reads as a verse of over praise, it will show the exact, op the exact opposite. They, will, they were ex actually not excellent at all in pursuing these aims. And this is how the irony works in the Hamira Maka. Yeah. This, um, this, this showing, uh, this, this placing of over statements of praise and, and, and contrasting this with, 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 with criticism. So, Kutfiraj, Chawan is... Um, he, he dies because he's looking at a dancing horse and he gets uh, confused and then the enemy captures him from behind. His successor, Harir Raja, is, he spends all his money on dancing girls. He also becomes deluded and the, kings, uh, and the, the enemy uh, kills him. Pahlada, his successor, he seems to have uh, had an addiction to hunting. Uh, he, 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 uh, Nayachandra describes how he starts, uh, he, he begins his hunt. Uh, and he kills a sleeping lion, lion, and he gets so enthusiastic that he stirs up another lion who kills him. So it's a, quite ironic because it's actually Perlada who is actually sleeping, and it's quite ironic that he, he gets so enthusiastic in killing a sleeping lion. Then another king, Viran, Viranarayana, is poisoned in the enemy's fort because he's not able to, re to resist the temptations uh, from the enemy. So. Nayachandra shows how all these kings fell victim to vices born from pleasure karma. And in fact, so in each case, pleasure leads to a state of inattentiveness, delusion, sleepiness, which then results in death. So remember that this is how so Nayachandra said earlier that they were excellent in pursuing these aims, but he has in fact shown the contrary. This is the irony of the Hamira Maka. So um, uh, I mean, actually, actually, all these episodes, they foreshadow what will happen during Hamira's own rule. And so Hamira is also described as a king who pursues dharma to become a vessel of pleasure to obtain Shri of heaven, the, the, the diva Shri, whereas instead he has to actually pursue the raja Shri, the, the Shri of, of, ro of royal fortune. It's also described as a greedy courtesan, as wicked in his mind, as deluded in his mind by lust. Uh, in fact, his, his rule can be summarized as follows. He, he insults his uh, loyal subjects, he loves loyal ministers, and he supports the traitors. So accordingly, his, uh, his vice can also be, um, be, be, be brought back to uh, the, the vice reproaching of other, others, which is also listed as a kamaja, 
uh, files. So I will show you further how this attitude, this ironic attitude works. So he has a, it's, there's also interesting irony in the name. So uh, Naya Chandra Suri, um, is, is a, it shows how, how Amira mutilates his intelligent minister, Dharma Sima, the lion of Dharma, will then avenge the injustice done to him. And similarly, he will replace his loyal minister, Boja, by a man named Rati Pala, a protector of sexual pleasure. It's, it's, it's funny that in later Amira traditions, this, this Rati Pala is called Raya Pala, the protector of kings. So he has changed his name into the protector of sexual pleasure. And this is how he, he ironically reflects on, on, this, on these events in, in a concluding remark. So when this Bhoja, this loyal minister, left to, to, to revenge his injustice, the king, with happiness running through his heart, suitably appointed the hero protector of sexual pleasure on the post of, get, of general. And by combining the threefold aims of human life, which are the only good on earth, Hamira continued spending his days in utmost pleasure. And this indeed is this, this Rati Pala who will uh, effect, in fact betray Hamira because he's bought off uh, with alcohol and sex, so he, he's, he, as his name suggests, of course, and it's, it's quite ironic that, um, that, um, that the Hamira is unaware of this, of this foolish decision and he just continues uh, um, with pursuing the threefold aims of life, which are the only good on, on earth. Whereas we know that uh, with his predecessors, this, this actually didn't turn uh, out well, this pursuit of the, of the aims of human life. Um, so. In the epilogue, uh, Naya Chandra Suri reflects on what, happens, uh, what happened after Hamira's death. He shows that there existed, there originated a, a Kavya Parampara, a tradition of poems about Hamira. Um, but he actually says that they, they only portrayed Hamira as a virtuous ruler, as a good ruler. Whereas instead, uh, Hamira, uh, Naya Chandra Suri has, has shown the opposite, actually. Um, and this is what, what he what he says afterwards. He says, out of delusion, people keep prattling that he, the powerful Chawan king, namely the noble Hamira, the only support of the world, went to heaven. But having approached truth and intelligence, we have to say that in a certain way, he's still alive on this earth and is to be seen everywhere with all his strength. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it again looks like, like some praise, but um, in, in fact, it's actually, an, I think he, he, um, he, he hints at like the, the power of poetry to immortalize kings. So all these poets before him has, have made Hamira the only support of the world, the virtuous ruler, whereas he has shown that he's actually a deluded king, a uh, bad ruler. And this, so he, he, says that, he says that these poets have created this image of Hamira being the noble king. And then he makes an ironical suggestion that another Chawan member deserves praise. He says, only Jaja and that natural affection should be praised in this world. By him, the fort was defended for two days when the king went to heaven. The Chawan, Jaja, has to be celebrated for a long time. So he kind of contrasts the attributed praise for Hamira with the, with the natural affection for another Chawan. It's actually just an ironical suggestion. And so, that is Amira Maikara can be thus read as an ironic eulogy. It's, it's, I'm not making this up. And it's also supported by uh, a 15th century commentary, um, Amira Maikara Deepika, by Jane, also by Jane Altern, which says that the hero of the poem is, is brave, but is also <coughs> selfish, cunning, boastful, deceitful, impetuous, and haughty. So this. It's, it's, it's a very unconventional character for a, an epic poem, Mahakavya. And now I want to reflect on how we can understand this unconventional character. Uh, so first of all, um, Naya Chandra was clearly, clearly inspired by Jain articulations of, of kingship in, in the story collections uh, called Prabhanda, which new genre which emerged during the Delhi Sultan period. And these, these story collections are, are much concerned with showing um, the, the life stories of exemplary rulers from Gujarat, like Kumara Pala. Um, and they are often contrasted with, with, with stories about non-exemplary rulers, like Bitfiraj or Jaya Chandra of Kanauj, who were defeated uh, by Muhammad Ghori. 
And in fact, the Nayachandra Suri has clearly borrowed from a particular collection of stories, the Prabhandhavali of Jina Badra Suri. Um, in this, in his Pritvaraj Prabhanda, is uh, is very explicit in in making fun of Pritvaraj. So he's he's described as a ruler who, um, who when ha when Muhammad Ghori attacks, is asleep for ten days, and when he wakes up, he he kills the remainder of his his own army. He's also described as someone who who, who foolishly releases one uh, his enemy seven times just for the sake of of pleasure. Um, and then it's also described how a horse called Nata Rambha, the beginner of dance, uh, yeah, kind of causes uh, the distraction for uh, Raj and, his, and his, does he is killed. And Nadia Chandra story is also clearly borrowed from this because he also uh, has this episode of Gori releasing his, uh, about Pitfraj releasing his enemy seven times. And he also has borrowed his joke about the, the horse called Nata Rambha. He does omit this expert criticism because he's, he's a poet, he's not a Jain moralist, so um, it's rather implicit. Um, but it's still, they convey the same meaning of Raj being a foolish king uh, who, caused his, who, who died because of his delusion. And Naya Chandra seems to extend this criticism to all the Chauhan kings. He, he, he portrays the Chauhan, all the Chauhan kings as sleepy, deluded kings. Um, so this is one uh, reason to, uh, to, to why this, this, this content of the Hamira Makkabi is so unconventional. But it can also not be fully understood without looking at the emergence of Bardic literature during the Delhi Sultan period. I should first make clear that in the first millennium, uh, there was radical opposition between uh, the realm of, of the vernac of vernacular um, Language which 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 uh, was was ex which belonged exclusively to to, a, to, the, to the realm of the sun and was was radically opposed with the realm of the literary the Sanskrit literary tradition, but during from the yeah, from the second millennium onwards we get a kind of blurring of these of these boundaries and we can also see this in the Pitrilaj tradition. Um, so this this negative portrayal about Pitrilaj as the as a foolish deluded king was probably founded by the Bard Chan Bardhai, who was at, who is um, described to be the he was he said to be the composer of the Pitfiraj Raso. Um, and interestingly, interestingly, the Jina Bhadra, this, this Jain Prabanda author, he quotes verses from this Bard named Chanda Baladiu or Chanda Baladika. Um, and he quotes this Bard as as a, he, he also is as the as character in this Prabanda. Uh, this Bard Chanda he. He reminds Pitraj of, of his bad conduct and he, he predicts his, his, uh, his death. Uh, his, and Pitraj then puts this bard in prison. Um, but it's, it's very interesting that uh, this chain author uh, quotes this, 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 this bard, uh, as also uh, like Z uh, Sasha has, um, has shown that this, all this Brabanda, that they quote this bardic <coughs> literature. And also this, this, this type of literature, this Brabanda literature, is very much infused by vernacular <coughs> expressions. It's much written in a collo more colloquial style Sanskrit. So this shows that this, this, this Brabantic tradition of Pitviraj developed alongside this, 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 this Sanskrit, more Sanskrit, uh, lit this Sanskrit literature, and was in, had become important enough to influence it. Um, so on the one hand, Nayachandra Suri was being uh, was inspired by this negative portrayal of Pitraj in Prabhana literature and probably also in the uh, Bardic, Bardic tradition. But on the other hand, he was being confronted with a positive portrayal of Hamira in a Bardic tradition, which was probably founded by the Bard poet Sharangadara. He's also the author of this Sharangadara Padati, a famous anthology of also Sanskrit verses. But in this anthology, we also have verses preserved in vernacular language which praise Hamira. And interestingly, this bard was also, um, also resided in the court of Gwalior in the end of the 14th century. And he is even quoted by Naya Chandra Suri. So, and, and so we, we, I could, you could argue, I, I could argue that, um, that Naya Chandra like, he was the, perhaps the first poet who brings together these traditions and, and writes an epic poem about Hamira to show how he was not in fact, not, it was in fact not, not, not much better than this, his predecessor, uh, Itviraj. Um, and he self-consciously also reflects on, um, on, on making a new poem and on this, 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 um, this new, this, this literary environment which, which was 
much changing in the 15th century. So at the last, in the penultimate verse of the Amira Maccabi, it says, at this time, there is no one able to make a poem that resembles the poets of old. This was being proclaimed by the courtiers in the court of Virama Tomara. Therefore, the poet, Nayat Chandra, endowed with a mind that is shaken by the fickle play on earth, composed a new poem about King Hamira, which is permeated with the erotic, heroic, and marvelous sentiment. And in fact, Nayat Chandra's epic poem is actually one of the last Sanskrit epic poems patronized by the court of Gwalior. And later, Gwalior became really a center of also of vernacular, uh, vernacular literary culture. Um, uh, but paradoxic, paradoxically, whereas, although he wants to emulate his old Sanskrit poets like Kalidasa and, and Sri Harsha, um, the content of his poem is very unconventional and its, and its overall meaning lies very close to what, for example, Romila Tapares observed about the Pituraj Raso as an explanation for the feat in the guise of eulogy. And remarkably, uh, Naya Chandra has also written uh, a poem in the rare Satakajar, which is much infused also by elements of dance and music. And it includes even a, a bardic song in old Marathi, and, and therefore he, he kind of really, um, yeah, uh, yeah, he really, uh, the, the conventions of Sanskrit literary culture really uh, challenged in, in, this, uh, in, in, this, in, in, in this poetry, actually. So, in conclusion, um, we could see that, that Nayashandra's poetry was really, really written at the, the turning point in North India's literary culture, where uh, this bardic literature and, and vernacular literature um, was really becoming more popular and, and was even replacing uh, the support for, for Sanskrit uh, poetry. And in the end, it's more prudent, actually, to, to view the Hamira Mahakavya as an ironic reworking of a popular hero from an oral bardic tradition into the once prestigious form of a Sanskrit epic poem, which was so clearly inspired by uh, Jane, a Jane critique of kingship. That's it.